With the 2023 conference season upon us, we're anticipating a number of high profile trial results to be announced. However, to whet your appetite, today we're going to reflect on a couple of really important SGLT2 inhibitor trial results that were announced last year. Firstly, the Emperor Kidney study, and secondly, the Deliver study. And helping us do that are Sarah and Patrick. Over to you. So this Emperor Kidney is the third SGLT2 inhibitor renal outcome study. Um, so the first being Credence, which just looked at people with type 2 diabetes and used canagliflozin. Second, DAPA CKD used dapagliflozin in both people who live with type 2 diabetes and without. And uh, the third is Emperor Kidney, which used empagliflozin. So why did we do the third one, need the third one, and what does it add? Well, it, it looked at, as I said, people with diabetes and without, so this goes beyond diabetes. But the thing which is different, all the other studies looked at people with really quite heavy albuminuria. And it, it's difficult if you read the papers because all the uh, units are always in the American units. So, um, uh, but, so it, it, it's, we're looking at 22.6 um, uh, um, in DAPA CKD, um, for example. And with Emper kidney, although the majority did have that heavy albuminuria, they, but they had to have a... Uh, an EGFR um, above uh, 45, but people below 45, they could be recruited if they had a urinary ACR above two. Um, so, so this really included a much broader group and, and, and ones we see in, in clinical practice, you know, about maybe about eight, 10 percent of our patients certainly with type 2 diabetes have microalbuminuria, this sort of between three and about 30. And it's only maybe two, three percent have that heavy albuminuria. And what was the outcome of the study? Well, it worked. So it, it achieved its primary outcome of of, of reducing uh, a composite outcome of, of renal and cardiovascular outcome events. But if we looked at the different groups, the people with a heavy albuminuria seem to do much better. And, and it, um, it, you have to really start looking not at, at, at the renal outcomes, but looking at the EGFR curves to be convinced that the lower levels of albuminuria were worth treating with empical flows in. Um, um, so, so I think what, what's the importance of that? Testing urinary ACR is really important. Um, and if you do that, we can therefore identify people who are going to gain more benefit from drugs like empagliflozin. Um, um, and maybe we just need to be a little bit more cautious uh, in, with people if their only other additional risk factor is that microalbuminuria um, based on these studies. Big caveat, though, these are relatively short studies. And of course, our patients with microalbuminuria have a long journey ahead of them of increased cardiovascular risk. So I'm still minded to add it. And I am party, I've got a conflict of interest here, uh, which is I'm part of, of the UK Kidney Association, uh, SGLT2 in, uh, uh, guideline, and they've certainly endorsed e uh, initiation of, um, uh, of uh, empagliflozin and SGLT2 inhibitor um, uh, with lower levels of urinary ACR. And also, um, Another caveat is they went down to another lower level. So we're now down at 20 uh, now. So it's safe to initiate. In fact, there's even some post hoc stuff, which, of course, we shouldn't talk about, um, which uh, uh, suggests that it actually might be beneficial to people even below that. And again, that's in that UK Kidney Association guideline. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for that. Uh, just a just a quick thought, perhaps, from you, Sarah. We've got quite a quite a we're growing in terms of our renal data now, aren't we? different cutoffs, different values for things. Is this, how easy is this to implement in clinical practice? Well, it's not easy. You know, we have an interest in this area, you know, which is great. So, but even still, you know, sometimes I have to think twice, well, what was the EGFR cutoff for that one again? You know, it's hard to keep across it, isn't it? Um, I think for, for me, this study reinforces that prioritizing SGLT2s in our patients with renal impairment is important. Uh, that if you want to make the maximum benefit, search for your patients with type 2 diabetes and the highest ACRs. Do you know, it won't be that many. It really won't be that many. You know, I did a search in my own practice. I think it was about 15 patients. Have a quick look through the notes. Are they on optimized ACE or ARB? Are they on an SGLT2 inhibitor? Because they probably should be. And also for me, it's the safety. These are safe to use at lower EGFRs. That's a mindset change because initially we had to use them in people with higher EGFRs, but it's okay. They're safe to use and you still get the cardiorenal protective benefits. Those are my, definitely my take homes from this particular study. Thanks, Sarah. There's some nice practical tips. There. I suppose it's the over, overarching concept, isn't it, that are important. And, and as you mentioned, it's an area which is just ready and ripe for some clinical searches and audits uh, on our clinical systems. Brilliant. So moving swiftly on, uh, Sarah, to your uh, research uh, study of the year. So you're going to tell us about the DELIVER 
study. So over to you. Thank you very much. So, so Deliver was a, a study looking at an SGLT2 inhibitor, dapagliflozin, in people with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, we kind of got away from the fact there's been loads of evidence around the SGLT2 inhibitors for people with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And many of us now will see patients being started on SGLT2 inhibitors, whether or not they've got type 2 diabetes, as one of their pillars of heart failure treatment if they have reduced ejection fraction. But our group of patients with preserved ejection fraction, so an ejection fraction above 40% when they go for their echocardiogram, they've had a bit of a bad lot because actually those medications that we're used to using in heart failure, so your ACE inhibitor, your beta blocker, your spironolactone and so on, actually they haven't shown prognostic benefit in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction before. And, and the prognosis is not great for this wide and indeed growing group of patients with preserved ejection fraction. So the DELIVER trial was the second in an SGLT2 inhibitor trials looking at patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure. The first had been Emperor Preserved, which came out in the autumn of 2021. And then we had DELIVER in 2022. So another big trial, over 6,000 patients, um, all with heart failure with eject preserved ejection fraction. So that's an ejection fraction greater than 40%. Now they divided those into three more subgroups in this trial, which made it a little bit different from the uh, Emperor Preserved trial. So they had one subgroup that had heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Stay with me, folks. I know this is a real big mouthful. So their ejection fraction is between 41 and 49%. So that kind of mid-range group, really between the two. Then they had the group with ejection fraction above 40%, you're kind of above 50% rather, your classic kind of preserved ejection fraction. And they had a third subgroup that was interesting. So patients with an improved ejection fraction. So at some stage, they'd had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And that had recovered to above 40%. So that was the third subgroup. So the patients were randomized to dapagliflozin 10 milligrams or placebo, followed up for just over two years. And the primary composite endpoint was a worsening in heart failure. So an admission or an acute event, an acute visit to clinic, or indeed cardiovascular death. And they showed a positive outcome. So an 18% relative risk reduction in that composite outcome after the two and a bit years of follow-up for the patients that received dapagliflozin, number needed to treat of 32 over that two-year period. Now, the composite outcome was mainly driven, the, the benefit was mainly driven by that reduction in worsening heart failure rather than necessarily the cardiovascular death component, which was interesting. And what was also interesting is that the, there were consistent benefits seen across all three of those subgroups. So it didn't matter if you were in that mildly reduced group, that preserved group, or indeed that improved group the benefits were consistent. And that added something to our knowledge because in the Emperor Preserve trial, actually the biggest benefits were seen in the patients with that mildly reduced ejection fraction, less so in the preserved ejection fraction group. Whereas in Deliver, we saw consistent benefits across the group. And indeed the safety um, outcomes were very reassuring as well. So for me, this reinforces the fact that actually great news for our patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction. We now do have agents, SGLT2 inhibitors, so far empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, that do show benefits. That's big news for this group of patients. Are we going to see them coming in then to our clinical practice? Well, we await um, the results of NICE. They've come out with some technology appraisals that actually at the moment are somewhat negative looking at this, concerns around cost effectiveness, mortality benefits and so on. So we wait to see perhaps the result of that going forwards. For me, it reinforces that if I've got a patient with type 2 diabetes and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, I'll be prioritizing these SGLT2 inhibitors in that group, certainly for now. Whether we see them used outside of type 2 diabetes, specifically for the indication of preserved ejection fraction, we wait to see. I hope so, because this evidence is really exciting for this group, Amrit. Absolutely, Sarah. Thanks for summarizing that. It'd be really interesting to get Patrick's thoughts on this, because you've got quite a keen eye on the way in which NICE conducts its um, technology appraisals. Give us a bit of a, an understanding of why perhaps it wasn't so positively. Well, I think, I mean, Sarah's already told us a lot about this. I think there is a there is more uncertainty about uh, mortality benefits. Um, whilst there is reduction in uh, hospitalization, um, this is a fairly heterogeneous group. There's a lot of people out there um, uh, in primary care who are probably living with heart failure, uh, with preserved ejection fraction, but or mildly reduced ejection fraction, who haven't been identified. Um, um, so I think, so that it's, it's really how we identify the group who are going to benefit from this. With clinical trials, they tend to recruit high-risk patients who are based in, in, in uh, cardiology clinics. But, but if we're going to deliver this treatment, it will be potentially to a much lower risk group. So I think so. that's the art, really, is to try to work out who would benefit uh, most um, so we can get the cost effectiveness. But it, it's, um, it's, it's a, it, I think for those people living with, with heart failure, with, with preserved ejection fracture, obviously these are potentially important troops because, as you say, as Sarah completely said, you know, they've got little else to offer them. Um, so it, it's, it feels that this is actually an important and, and not an overlooked group, but, but one which evidence, sadly, has, has been less effective. So I, if I've, 
I suspect they will get their nice uh, technology appraisal. There's often this sung and dance, isn't there, before uh, uh, there's a final uh, 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 document which is produced. But um, so I remain hopeful. So there you have it, uh, results from two really important SGLT2 inhibitor trials that again have shown that this group of medications are having an, an ever expanding uh, spectrum of indications across that cardiorenal metabolic spectrum and which is very much the bread and butter of primary care management of those conditions and using this medication as well. So we could have chosen a number of other studies to talk about from last year, but these were two that we picked out that were really, we thought, important for primary care from a practical perspective. However, over the coming next few weeks and months, as we get into the summer and autumn of 2023 and uh, attend some of these conferences, we're expecting to hear of a number of other exciting trial results being announced. So stay tuned for those. Uh, but for today, that's all from us. We hope you've enjoyed this video. Bye bye.